across the country and across the world today, uh, there's going to be the standard debates that take place around this time of the year about this super sensitive and controversial topic about Mawlid or Milad. Now, I want to make the disclaimer. Today's discussion is not meant to provoke more controversy. It's not even meant, frankly, for the elders in the audience. It is meant to educate our youngsters. It is meant to provide for them a framework in a slightly different manner. Because my goal is really to protect Islam in the next generations. And to make sure that these types of differences are situated in the broader picture. For the academic stuff, I have spoken in a lot of detail about this topic. You can go online, you can Google the reality of bid'ah by Yasir Qadi. I have an hour and a half lecture. Academic, it goes over the differences in a very different manner. That's not today. If you want to talk about the history of this celebration, I have a three-part series online. The history of the Mawlid by Yasir Qadi. I have three-part series, 30 pages, article, online. It's on a blog. You can just log on, read it. This is not the academic talk. I want to speak to the elders and say to them, that not talking about these sensitive topics is not going to help the future. Our children are well aware, if you log on to Facebook or Twitter today, even though Alhamdulillah I'm no longer part of that social domain, I guarantee you, you will find this post there, this post there, and our children are connected to this media. And they are seeing students of knowledge, people of knowledge, attacking one another. The one says this is bid'ah, the other says no it is blood, the one says this, the one says that. So today's talk is not meant to get into the academics. You want the academics? Go and listen to those other lectures. Today's talk, I want to bring in three separate points. So that inshallah ta'ala, we take a step back and look at the bird's eye view. Look at it from a different angle. I'm going to bring in three separate subjects or three separate topics. The first of them, believe it or not, is psychology. What has psychology got to do with aqidah? Actually quite a lot. And if you listen to many of my lectures, you will know that I bring in other disciplines to explain social phenomena. This is something that we need to be open-minded about. In psychology, in anthropology, in the study of cultures, in the study of human beings, I'm going to teach you a concept, then I'm going to come back to the issue of Mawlid. This concept is independent of Mawlid. It's a historical, it is an observed phenomenon. It is a reality that has been observed by different anthropologists, cultural scientist, uh, psychologist. It has many different names. Of them, it is called, you can Google these, uh, the narcissism of small differences. It is called the banality of trivial differences. It is called the law of trivialities. These are certain terms given to it. What is this banality of differences? What is this narcissism of small differences? Scientists have observed, listen to this carefully, any two groups of people or even any two individuals, the closer they are, listen to this carefully, the bigger they make the trivial differences between them. I want you to observe and absorb this reality. This is a phenomenon that transcends religion. Ethnic differences, political differences, cultural differences, corporate differences in politics, we observe these differences. The narcissism of trivial differences. It means when two groups or two people are very close, instinctively, it is easier to exaggerate small differences. Why? Psychologists say, for some people, this is a defense mechanism. You have to define yourself against your closest competitor. You have to define yourself against those that are actually in the grand scale of things the closest to you. Because the biggest threat to your pure independence does not come from people far, far, far away. The biggest threat from your pure identity comes from those that are overlapping but just slightly different. So this is an observed phenomenon that we see across the spectrum. And that's why, for example, sometimes, usually, the most worst racism is actually between one ethnicity, where one person comes from versus another person, one tribe of this country versus the other tribe. There's a level of visceral hatred to the close tribe than even the farther tribe. For example, one of the most common manifestations of this is in political groups that aspire to the same goal. 
but they're bickering amongst them, you would think the two of them are the worst enemies. Right? Even though they have the same goal, the same overall, but because they're two separate groups, because they have two separate, slightly different agendas, you will find them hating on one another, sometimes to the point of it causes them to lose track of the actual goal and open your eyes to the reality of political activism. You know this to be the case. This phenomenon also explains a reality that we all know. It is easier for any faith based community, it is easier for a masjid to have an interfaith dialogue than to have an intrafaith dialogue. We have had Christians and Jews right here speaking to you. Nobody batted an eyelid. Brutally honest, I'm just explaining to you this law. If I were to invite somebody of another firqa and bring him here, the backlash that will be caused would be Allah and Mustan. I'm not saying I want to do that, don't worry. Don't throw tomatoes at me yet. But I'm just explaining to you the banality of trivial differences. We have had Christian pastors a few weeks ago, right here, and the whole crowd was thanking, MashaAllah, thank you for coming, this and that, explaining to us about, we have had Jewish, we have had, and everybody understands, we've never had a non-Sunni have a pleasant dialogue with a Sunni here. It's far more awkward. Why is it more awkward? One of the reasons, the banality of trivial differences. That psychologically, in order to have a defense mechanism against the other, in fact, the closer that other is, the more visceral the reaction is. If you understand this point, brothers and sisters, then flutter back to our example. The groups that celebrate the Mawlid and the ones that don't celebrate the Mawlid, they have a shared common identity in mainstream Sunnism. Each group studies the authors and the ulama of the other. You cannot become an alim of one of these groups without having studied the books of the other group. Our books of hadith are the same. Our books of fiqh are the same. Our books of lugha are the same. Our books of tafsir are the same. Really, we have almost the same heritage. But we differ on minutia. So, when you bring in this psychological reality, you will help to cope with the reality that, you know, sometimes these trivial differences are exaggerated because the real, quote-unquote, threat to those who want to maintain what they view as a pure identity, right? Because again, here's the point. Do you consider this to be 100% pure identity? Well, then who's your real threat? Those that are 90% and only 10% different. So there's a human construct. There's a psychological observed phenomenon to make a small difference bigger than it needs to be. Keep this point in mind to the next generation. That was the first point. I brought in some psychology. Second point I want to bring in, history. And by history, I mean, this is a really deep topic and I'm afraid I'm not going to give you too many examples because it is a deep topic. But you will have to trust me that this is my opinion. Take it or leave it. And this is my expertise, the history of ideas, my actual master's PhD, intellectual history, how uh, movements, how theologies evolve. One thing that we all notice when you, when you do a deep dive in this field is the following. In every generation, a controversy comes and you have a spectrum of opinion. It takes a while for that spectrum to become solidified and the next generation or, or even the generation after that will then come to terms with this diversity and you will have a spectrum that is tolerated. Okay, this difference is okay. And then a spectrum that's beyond the toleration. This begins in the era of the Sahaba. And every subsequent generation, new controversies, a spectrum. Then we decide, okay, this much will allow, this much will cut off. Then we decide. So every generation is negotiating the spectrum of diversity of the previous generation. That's a deep idea. I cannot give you too many examples because it's going to get very deep very quite quick. I'll give you some simplistic examples. Even from the time of the Sahaba, believe it or not. By the way, even in the prophetic era, when the Prophet was alive, differences were very, very, very few. Why? Because you can't have a difference when the Prophet is amongst you. Any ikhtilaf, you go to him directly. But even in his lifetime, we saw the kernel of human intellect trying to derive from the Quran, from the Sunnah, and having two different opinions. For example, the most famous example is the incident of, of the Banu Quraidah when the Prophet ﷺ said, do not pray Asr until you reach the Banu Quraidah. And I've gone over this in detail, I don't have time to go into it now. 
one group of Sahaba, they were about to hit Maghrib. One group of Sahaba was literal. And they said, okay, the Prophet said, don't pray Asr. This means we will make Asr Qada. We're not going to pray Asr. Maghrib is going to come. We're not going to pray Asr. We're going to walk all the way to Banu Quraidah. And then because they were delayed. The, the goal, the Prophet said this at Dhuhr time. Had they obeyed him immediately, they would have reached Banu Quraida before Maghrib. But you know, the news took a while to spread. It took an hour or two. By the time they left the city, it was late. Magh- Asr was already there. So on the way to Banu Quraida, you have hundreds of Sahaba and the sun is setting. The Prophet is already waiting for them Banu Quraida. What do they do? Half of them took the literal hadith. Do not pray Asr. Khalas, let it go. Let it go, Qada. We will pray after Maghrib. We're going to pray Asr. They did that. The other half said, no. The point of the process when he said it at Dhuhr was hurry up and make your way to Maghrib. But we got late, put our armor on, took a while. So the goal was to make haste. We didn't make haste. We should pray Asr because we know we're supposed to pray Asr. And then we'll meet up the process and pray Maghrib with him. So half of them prayed Asr. Half of them didn't pray Asr. What is the ikhtilaf here? Ikhtilaf in the faham, in the tasawwur, in the trying to extract from the Qur'an and Sunnah. And the Prophet did not get angry at either of them. The goal was the same, the niyyah was the same, they had an ikhtilaf. And we have another incident in Sunnah Al-Tirmidhi where the Prophet heard the Sahaba start talking about some advanced issue of Qadr, some issue of, of, of one of the most complex issues of Islam, predestination. One group is quoting verses, another group is quoting another series of verses. Each one is, now the, the hadith does not tell us what aspect by the way, so we don't know. The hadith is, does not tell us what exactly, but they were arguing over a theological point. And the Prophet came out angry at them. And he said, is this what I've commanded you to do? You fight one another over these concepts. You take an idea and each one is trying to. Then he warned them. He said, this is how the previous ummas were destroyed. Too much fighting over these abstract issues. What's the benefit in this? This hadith is in Tirmidhi. He warned them to stop going down this path. And he did not take sides. Another interesting point here. In his lifetime, we have the beginnings. Of course, after he وسلم, left this world, the Sahaba did have differences. They had a lot of fiqhi differences. Our madhahib, where do they come from? The bulk of these differences go back to the Sahaba. They not only have fiqhi, they had political differences. These political differences were so severe, sometimes they went to war. And later generations said, you know what? We're going to ignore that war. They're one group. Obviously, when that is happening, there's not one group, there's two groups. But it took a while, one generation, you know what? Let's just not talk about it, they're one group. It takes a generation. And they had even theological differences. Amongst the Sahaba, you have the beginnings of slight theological differences. For example, one of the Sahaba said that when the Prophet went up to Israel and Mi'raj, he saw Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Ra'a Rabbahu. And another Sahabi, our mother Aisha, she said, No, he did not see Allah, he saw the veil of Allah. Each one had two different opinions. One Sahabi claimed he saw Allah. The other Sahabi claimed, yani the, our mother claimed, no, he did not see Allah. Also amongst the Sahaba, there is a difference over, can you go to the Qabr and have a conversation with the person in the grave? Does the dead person hear you? If you go to the Qabr and you say, Assalamu Alaikum, and you know, make dua and whatnot, everybody says you can go to the Qabr and make dua. Everybody says that to Allah. The question is, does he know? Can he hear? This is amongst the Sahaba, you have some Sahabi said he ha- can, other Sahaba said he cannot. The issue of wearing a Quranic amulet, a Quranic, um, uh, yani ta'weez we call it in Urdu, right? Tama'im, right? Quranic, Ayatul Kursi, whatnot, right? We have authentic narrations from the Sahaba that they did it. And we have authentic narrations that some of them others discouraged against it. So we have a spectrum of opinion from the first generation. And I can go on and on, the second, third, fourth generation, new controversies come, a spectrum of opinion occurs. Then the next generation has to decide which level of difference can be overlooked. And which level we say, oh, that's too far. So it's a constant negotiation in every single issue. Therefore, history teaches us that you can have a controversy that might be considered a big deal at one time. And a few generations later they say, okay, well, let's let it pass and consider them to be acceptable. And by the way, 
the four madahib is an example of this because once upon a time there were more than four madahib. Our qiraat of the Quran are an example of this. Once upon a time there were more than seven and ten qiraat. And I can give you many more examples. I don't want to confuse you. But this is a historical fact. And if you want advanced stuff, you can listen to some of my library chats and whatever is over there. So I brought in history. So I'm going to bring in three things. Number one was psychology. Number two, history. Number three, context. So what, so what does this do with our molded issues? Our molded issues. It is possible that some people in previous generations made this a big deal. Just because they made it a big deal, we don't have to make it a big deal. History teaches us that you can renegotiate. And this has been done for many issues. Why can't we do it for another issue? And then the third thing I want to bring in is context. Context. What do I mean by context? Context causes us to rethink how important the controversy is. A controversy might be real, but the context makes this controversy trivial. Let me give you a simple example we all understand. Somebody is drowning and you know how to swim, you can help him. At that point in time, do you ask, what is your aqidah, brother? What do you say about this theological position? And based upon that, I'll jump in and help you or not. Context dictates that you don't care at this point in time. Now, I gave an extreme example. But I'll quote you a scholar that many people deem to be very hardline. I don't see him that way, but many people do. Shaykh al-Islam ibn Taymiyyah. Many people say Ibn Taymiyyah was a hardline cleric. Khair, that's their view. Let me tell you one thing about Ibn Taymiyyah. It is true. It is true he wrote about the Mawlid against the Mawlid. It is true that he looked at some other groups within Sunnism as having major differences. He didn't like some other groups. But he has a passage in a book of his in which he says... This other group that I don't like, if they are living in a land of non-Sunnis, those who don't like the Sahaba, whatnot, those group, we will consider them to be Sunnis and we will ally ourselves with them and we will be one against people who don't respect the Sahaba. Now Ibn Taymiyyah says this about a Sunni group that he didn't like living amongst non-Sunnis. What then do you think when we are living amongst non-Muslims? What do you think when we're living amongst non-Muslims? Should we take? But the point he's trying to say is, if I were living in those lands, I would not be having this debate with these people. That's what he's saying himself. But because we're not, we have the luxury of concentrating on these differences, I'm going to do that. So Ibn Taymiyyah, whatever you want to say about him, he understood the context. And by the way, when the Mongols came, he allied with the very groups he intellectually refuted against. In books, he did not like some groups. When the Mongols invaded, <laughs> there was no ikhtilaf. We're all one hand against them. So context allows us to rethink through how important differences are. Therefore, in 2023 America, is the biggest threat we face who celebrates the Mawlid versus who doesn't? Wallahi, no. Look around you, brothers and sisters. Our quantity of Muslims in this land is less than 1%. Of this less than 1%, the percentage that are praying five times a day and wanting to be good Muslims is probably what? Probably what? 50%? If that? Of that 50% of 1%, the percentage that actually wants to study academic Islam and wants to be aware of these different madahib, different firah, different positions, is probably less than 10% of the 50% of the 1%, i.e. 0.01%. So here we are in this land. 0.01% of us are interested in these abstract and we're going to cut each other's Islam and Iman. We're going to put each other down. We're going to say, you're not a good Muslim. You're not a muftadir, this and that. Subhanallah, a'udhu billah. What foolishness is this? So I conclude with this simple point. And this is my opinion. Sisters and brothers, especially the youngsters, you will always find, you will always find clerics who want to foment hatred, who want to preach a narrow version of haq versus batil. And I warn you, it's very alluring. It's a slippery slope. It makes you feel good. But wallahi, it is dangerous. It is dangerous. Before you look at the differences with your Muslim brother, look at what you have in common. And when you discover that what you have in common is 95% of a shared heritage, then billahi wallahi alaykum, is this what you want to fight and bicker over? Is this what you want to have in your heart an enmity against? So 
my position about the maulid, you know it and you see it. What are we doing in this masjid? You know it and you see it. But at the same time, in my heart, there is nothing of hatred or animosity against any mainstream Muslim who has a tradition of great ulama. He has an entire galaxy of stars of ulama he's looking up to, and so do I. So why should I come and hate a person for wanting to show something in a way that I don't necessarily want to do it myself? What's the big deal? In light of the banality of differences, in light of history, in light of our context, live and let live. And if you want to really get involved in these abstract and detailed issues, find a group of dedicated, serious students of knowledge, take them aside, teach them advanced stuff, and when you get to this issue, teach them your views. But even when you teach them your views, make sure you don't teach them to hate or look down upon the other side. Make sure you explain what you think is right, and realize, you know what, it's been a thousand years we've been debating these issues. One thousand years we have been debating these issues. What was the point? Where did we gain? What was the benefit in all of this? You're not going to change the course of Islamic history. These differences will remain and last. So we should learn from all of these issues, psychology, history, and context, and live and let live. Choose your position, follow your scholars, and move on to the bigger issues. And whatever you do, do not divide the community. Do not preach hatred. Do not foment sectarianism. Do not teach a Muslim to have in his heart hatred or looking down upon another Muslim. Wallahi, the rights of Islam are far more than this. And when you find those preachers that are obsessed with these trivial differences, my humble advice is up to you. Don't follow such people. Because you will always find people who want to bring the ummah together. We are all the part of the ummah of the Prophet wasallam. Both groups, they want to show love in different ways. Why don't you look at the fact they want to show love? Why don't you look at that in common? How can you hate somebody who wants to show love to the Prophet wasallam? You might not agree with how he's doing it. Or that person might not agree that you're not doing it. But look at in the hearts, each one, what do they want to do? They want to love the Prophet wasallam. That love, that is our means to Jannah. That love, that's going to bring shafa'ah on the day of judgment. The love, even if you make a mistake in that love, Allah Azza wa will bless you for that love. So, live and let live. You understand your position and let the other group do its own. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allow us the wisdom to transcend these differences and be united for the sake of Allah under the ummah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Jazakumullah khair. Assalamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.